All right, guys, what's up? We're live back for the third installment of the series on money. The Unplugged Alpha podcast. We're at the 85th episode. What's going on? How are you guys doing tonight? All right, let's get into this so we can make sure we have time for some Q&A. Call-in will be open about halfway through the show, so we'll get, we'll get time for a few people calling in at least for sure. Now, in the other in the other episodes, if you haven't seen them yet, we covered uh, origin of money, credit, um, vesting. This one is always popular with viewers. Uh, it explains very clearly the six main paths to life changing wealth. So, real money. People always say, "How do you make real money? How do you make bank? I want to become rich." Blah blah blah. These are your options. You know, there's there's some people who say, "Look, you know, you can." You can do it. Um, you know, there's gigs you can do on oil rigs and other stuff like that. But I mean, look, you're working 12 hours a day, whatever the sequence happens to be, three weeks on, you know, three weeks off sort of thing. And maybe you make a few hundred grand. But I don't know anybody that's done that job that still does it. I know a lot of people that have done that job and they're like, I'm not doing it anymore. It's not worth it. So I'm going to exclude anything that's, that's, uh, insane if you will you know <laughs> one of the one of the stories a couple of the guys you know told me that i've heard more than once now is like every three or four weeks somebody either gets injured really badly loses like a body part or, or is killed um so you know you can take it for what it's worth but there's always high risk and high paying jobs out there that in my estimation you probably want to not put too much time into so there are six paths to wealth which we're going to dive into so get your pen and paper ready uh, i should also remind you guys um, to make sure you are on my email list the school of entrepreneurship will be opening for enrollment uh, next monday i think it's may 1st um, for the enrollment period which will close around uh saturday i believe which i think is the sixth something like that yeah uh, and then I'm away the week after that. I'm on a hog hunt with some friends. So path number one, let's begin. C-suite jobs. Um, there are only so many C-suite jobs that are available out there. If you're not familiar with a C-suite job, CEO, CTO, CFO, these are C-suite jobs. There's, there's lesser versions of them. Kevin, the VP of sales, for example, might make some pretty decent money, but he doesn't have a chief... That's what the C stands for, for C-suite. He doesn't have the C in front of his job title. Um, there's only so many of these jobs available. And if we're being honest, um, you tend to have to put on a lot of time to get to them. In that industry, sometimes in that company, it's very rare that you'll, you know, you hear stories where, well, you know, Bob started out in the mail room in, you know, 1963 and he worked his way all the way up to the CEO position. Does it happen? Yeah. Is it frequent? No, it's very infrequent. Um, but they are out there and they do make tremendous amounts of money. You have tremendous influence and power. Um, some of the richest people in the world are, sit at C-suite you know, positions. Uh, Tim Cook. Let's just look him up real quick here on my other screen. How much did Tim Cook make last year? Again, extreme example uh apple ceo securities and exchange commission filing that cook's compensation target was 49 million dollars down from his 84 million dollars last year uh these are earnings target that include all benefits bonuses stock options everything right so that's a that is some fat stacks of cash right there again uh very few of these jobs are available they do pay immense amounts of money and uh you're gonna have to find ways to wiggle into them right you know if you want if that's what you want you want to be the big boss of the big company um it's not often the founder that is sitting in that position is probably the other thing that i should mention there's lots of people that have founded very successful companies that no longer sit at the head of the table uh, in fact, it seems like the lifespan of a founder might be less than 10 to 20 years. 20 years is pretty extreme. I think it's more on the stretch of things, but somewhere between 10 and, and 20 years seems to be the lifespan of most CEOs. They just, it's, it's, it's a shifting tide and eventually they have to find somebody to replace them that is 
typically or expected to be better than them at the the task. Um, I remember the story around um, when Steve Jobs basically replaced himself with, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but they poached him from Coca-Cola, I think. Um, he ended up getting pushed out of his own company at that time, and then he founded uh, Next Computers, went back to Apple. You know, Obviously, he didn't last uh, too long after that. Uh, he got sick and died, and then Tim took over. But there you have it. Path number one is a C-suite job. If you have a large cor corporation making lots and lots of money, you're going to make lots and lots of money off that corporation as the head of the uh, head of the household, if you want to call it. Anyway, uh, let's get into path number two, which is licensed professionals. And you're going to need a big fat stack of degrees for this one. Uh, C-suite jobs, you generally want to have some sort of acumen, university acumen, uh, degree for something business related, but it's not necessary to have them. Um, but it does exist. Licensed professionals, we're talking about doctors, lawyers, accountants, surgeon. You've gone to school for a number of years and you're world class at your craft. You can make some serious money. Several hundred thousand dollars a year can be earned as a licensed professional. If you're a top shelf lawyer, um, you can make close to a million dollars a year. Um, there's lots of partners at law firms downtown here in Toronto that I know. Uh, they're paid anywhere from five, six hundred thousand upwards of nine hundred thousand to just over a million dollars, depending on what it is they're doing, what area of law they practice in, how good they are with clients, how good they are with acquiring business for the law firm, that sort of stuff. Accountants, too, if you're a top shelf accountant, if you're a tax accountant, you know, if you deal with large transactions. Basically, the more money that is moving around in that space in the licensed professional area that you're working in, the 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 bigger it's not the bigger piece of the pie. It's just that it's a bigger pie. So that small piece of the bigger pie that comes your way happens to be bigger in connection with that. Um, so you want to keep that in, keep that in consideration. There's there's areas of licensed professionals that don't make huge amounts of money. So there's there's paralegals, for example. Um, which may only make a hundred or one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. That's a licensed professional, but it but it's a lower area of of law, right? Um, so you have to consider those things. You want to look for areas that you're interested in. You know, I always ask people why they're doing something. My, um, I ended up having to get a new barber because my guy, you know, switched up anyway. So this younger kid, he's taking a legal program in uh, school here. He likes law. He's asking, you know, he's asking a lot of good questions about entrepreneurship and stuff. He's got an interest. He knows what I do. And, you know, I'm I'm always interested in why did you sign up for law? What kind of curriculum is there? You know, what is the typical student? You know, what's the percentage of men versus women in the program sort of thing? Interestingly, it's it's mostly women that are taking uh, law right now. But licensed professionals in path number two can make you a good deal of money, provided you're willing to put up with the immense amount of time and work like uh being an er doctor being a surgeon requires a lot of stress precision long hours law is ridiculous long hours um lawyers especially if you're a junior lawyer and you're ascending the ranks and you want to make your way up to partner um it's not uncommon to work several like 20 hour days in a row especially if you have contracts and deals to get done uh, it wasn't uncommon when I was uh, engaged. My ex-wife just before was a lawyer. I get a call at 11 o'clock at night. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, I'm going to bed. Well, you know, what are you up to? Well, I got to get this big corporate merger deal, blah, 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 done. My dinner just came. It's like, it's insane. The amount of the amount of time and hours and the total amount of responsibility that, that, that comes with the uh, prestige of being a, you know, you've got your mahogany framed degrees with your name, the university of whatever, and you know, whatever county or, or city or, or state people, people like that, but it's, I don't know too many very successful lawyers that stay in the field without breaking down at some point, if you know what I'm saying. Um, I have, I have a business partner in one of the fields that I'm in and He's, he's a licensed lawyer, but he doesn't practice law on a day-to-day -day basis. But he uses his experience in law in his business ventures, and it actually makes him a better entrepreneur. So it's funny because I have a good friend of mine down in the States. Um, he may even be watching this. He's, he's part of my business forum. But he's a, um, 
he's an entrepreneur and he's a licensed doctor. Um, and I've asked him, you know, before I said, you know, do you see yourself as a doctor first or do you see yourself as an entrepreneur first? And the answer was entrepreneur. Um, so it's interesting how these things shift and how they move about because one of the paths we're going to be talking about obviously is going to be entrepreneurship, but we'll get towards that towards the end. But again, path number two, licensed professionals. You can make a lot of money. It's life-changing money. Uh, there's a lot of prestige that comes with that. Um, I've had these conversations before where you could have a um, highly skilled tradesman, like a plumber, for example. He may own his own plumbing practice with a few people that work for him. Could be making a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, and he and a junior lawyer may be dating the same gal. And if the gal sees a junior lawyer who might, might only be making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, depending on what firm he's with, but a lot less money as more prestigious and more uh, valuable to bring home to Thanksgiving and introduce to the family, the prestige of that position has some value uh, out there in the world as well, too. Uh, not to discount, you know, the great guys out there that do work with their hands. It's just, you know, licensed professionals can make quite a bit of money later on down the road once they've put in the time and, you know, earn their stripes. But it also comes with a certain degree of respect and prestige, right? Uh, path number three is a person of influence. Um, I've used other terms for this before. I think a person of influence is probably the best way to umbrella code it because you might bring in other people of influence people of influence as well uh, under that description. But when I was a kid, a person of influence would have been um, a musical artist, an actor. You know, when I was a kid, I'd watch, uh, you know, the first Tom Cruise movie, uh, Top Gun, you know, the original one, like the OG. Even the new one's great too. But, you know, that would be considered a, a person of influence. Uh, to me, a guy like James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica, was a person of influence, right? Today, you can expand that quite broadly to anybody that has any influence on any platform because there's quite legitimately nobodies five years ago that are now considered people of influence. Even two or three years ago could be considered a person of influence because they've got, I don't know, million subscribers on YouTube. They've got uh, 10 million followers on some other social media platform. Um, even, even that uh, fruitcake on um you know, social media is getting a lot of attention over the last uh, several months. Dylan Mulvaney, the guy that dresses up as a girl and, you know, says that he's a girl. Day number 81 of being a girl. And now you've got all these brands using him to promote their products and services because he brings attention. When you command the attention of an audience, that is a, a, a position of value that allows you to earn. Um, so it's not just having influence and being influential a lot of that by the way is very attractive to women when it comes to dating on a sexual marketplace you know with attraction stuff like that but you also have the ability to earn money you know when you when you command an audience if, if you're an artist and you you know produce a uh, musical piece or an album or something like that and people buy it or they download it from itunes or whatever you're a person of influence you know you influence culture uh lizzo influences culture you know she's she's trying to convince people right now that uh, you can be beautiful at any size. In fact, the size that she's at is more beautiful than probably the size that a healthy fit person is. It's a health influencer is today. A uh, person of influence has a large umbrella, but again, life-changing money. There's all kinds of videos on YouTube with um, you know people that have substantial audiences, two, three, four, five million you know followers um, that will make videos like how much money I make on YouTube sort of thing. And it's like, you know, you'd be surprised to learn. You know, like some of them just in ad revenue alone can make seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a day if they're getting enough views. Um, having having influence has is a term that's expanded beyond just selling albums or tickets to the movie theater at a box office launch now. Uh, legitimately, we've seen people like The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, collaborate with social media influencers because their audience is almost as big, if not in some cases, might be even bigger. So it is, it is a path to wealth. And it is, in some cases, it is not that difficult a path to wealth because people are, aren't very bright, if we're being honest. People are pretty stupid in, in general. Maybe the IQs are lowering, I don't know. But 
based on people's voting patterns, which tells me, I mean, you know, you look at Canadians. I live in Canada. Look who our prime minister is that they keep voting in. We've got this Muppet who's going to be leading our country for another couple of years still until 2025. Um, that's, that's, that's the level of intelligence. So you don't actually have to be a talented musician anymore. In fact, I would argue music today sucks in comparison to the music that I grew up on. Uh, even, even the music in the seventies, um, you know, the golden era of rock and roll, you know, if you talk about bands like Led Zeppelin with John Bonham on the drums, right? Phenomenal, phenomenal. You know, today people just like, you know, you get these Lizzo's of the world that get the attention and, you know, the interest of the youth, uh, you know, of brands even and brand deals. Uh, so you don't have to be incredibly talented anymore. In fact, it's not even a requirement as it used to be. And because there's no gatekeepers, which used to exist, by the way, you know, you you would need the permission of a gatekeeper to put out an album, to write a book. Um, today, anybody can write a book. Any le Legitimately, anybody can write a bunch of words, uh, format it correctly so that it can be uploaded on Amazon, and you can publish your own book. Will it sell? Probably not if you don't have an audience or you don't have any influential reach, but anybody can publish a book. So gatekeepers for video production, me and you watching right now would press the exact same upload button on YouTube if you're publishing a video. I use Stream, StreamYard to broadcast. Me and you could broadcast simultaneously and just go go live. I push the exact same button that anybody else does, right? It's just the gatekeepers have been completely removed. So being of some influence can, you know, make life-changing money for you. You know, we've seen lots and lots of people that have done it in the past. And again, you don't have to be talented. You don't have to be good. You know, you don't have to be a good man or even be good at being a man. You know, there's a lot of nefarious actors out there that create massive influence out of people that follow them. So, you know, the removal of the gatekeeper is good and bad. It's, you know, it's good in the sense that anybody can do it. You don't need anybody's permission to go and produce music on, um, any streaming platform or video or publish a book. Gatekeep gatekeepers are gone. Poof. See you later. So you're going to get a lot more traffic, but you're also going to get a lot of fruitcakes as well, too. Let's go on to path number four. Uh, very high ticket sales. So you generally get a commission when you sell stuff. Um, if you like when I was a teenager, I used to work at a stereo store. Um, the, the chain went out of business decades ago, but it was a cool job for a teenager. I, you know, I love going in there and setting up stereos and, you know, like the surround sounds and the Dolby and all that sort of stuff. And we had these big 12 inch laser discs. And I remember going in there on Saturdays and we'd throw in Pink Floyd, Delicate Sound of Thunder. And, you know, you just pound it out. People would come into the store and they'd buy TVs and VCRs and stereo speakers and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. I would get paid commission for every sale. So, but I mean, if you're selling like a $400, you know, tape deck or a CD player or VCR or something like that, you weren't making a lot of money. It was a few bucks here and there, but it would pile up and you'd get a little bit of bonus and, you know, like on top of your salary. Uh, but very high ticket sales, again, is a percentage of the purchase price of the item. You sell a $20 million house and your agent commission is two and a half percent. That's fat stacks of cash. Uh, you sell a $200 million yacht. You're, you've got a percentage of that. That's fat stacks of cash. You sell a private jet to a successful uh, person of influence, let's say. You got a percentage of that. Fat stacks of cash. If if you like sales and you enjoy sales, I strongly encourage you to get into high ticket sales as fast as you can. Um, if you start out selling cars instead of say, selling Kias, get a job selling McLarens or Ferraris or Lamborghinis or Range Rover or Jet, like higher, you know, higher more more premium brands if you will um the bigger the sales receipt happens to be the bigger your commission should be so um i've often said you know i was challenged with this not too long ago somebody said to me um let's grab a sip over here somebody said to me that they said you know what would be your advice for young women today you know that want to get married young and find a successful guy i'll be honest with you <clears throat> If I was a hot 19 year old chick, I'd get into high ticket sales. Hot 19, 20, 21 year old chick, I'd get into high ticket sales. 
Um, forget about stupid degrees, gender studies and all that stuff. I, I figure out how to start selling, uh, yachts or private jets. Cause guess who's buying that stuff? Very successful, wealthy men with lots of money and influence and they got their life sorted out. You know, you connect those two things done. There you go, ladies. I've just solved your problem. You know, but then again, not a lot of 19, 20, 21 year old women watch this stuff, right? Um, path number five. STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. These are these are kind of the more geeky, you, you know, uh, fields, but they make a lot of money too. Um, the Fang companies, uh, what are they? Facebook, Amazon, you know that, you know that group, you know the the Silicon Valley sort of uh, crowd where they program, they code, you know, they're engineers or software engineers, stuff like that. I've had several calls with guys getting divorced. You guys know that I do private consults. My rate's high. So, I mean, it's high just so I don't fully book my time, obviously. But a lot of the time when I'm talking to these guys, it's like you get the successful enge engineer. He's married for two, three years. Sometimes they come from, um, you know, Asia or India, you know, for example, and then they're working for Facebook or Amazon. They're making fat stacks of cash, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars a year, plus whatever options they can get out of it and any other benefits. And, you know, they're working crazy hours, but they're making loads and loads of money. Um, you know, the questions that I always ask people when they're when they're going through the divorce grinders, all right, well, what do you do for a living? What did you make last year? You know, what does your wife do living? What did she make last year? So I get all this information. You know, that's how I've been able to compile a lot of this information that I'm able to provide to you guys in uh, podcasts and, and stuff like this. But STEM jobs can pay very, very well if you select the right one. If you get something, you know, that's a useless degree that's not Pay you at least a few hundred thousand, half a million a year, uh, doesn't have growth room, you're not going to make it there. But there's some that pay very, like incredibly well. There was another guy that I had talked to at one point that was making $1.2 million engineering. He, he was, um, what do they call them? Uh, tech leads or lead techs or something like that, you know, running a team of guys, huge amounts of money. So, you know, there's that to consider. But again, it's, it's, it's not, it's not as prestigious it's not as influential. And a lot of the times, I think a lot of these guys get a bit of a bad rap. And some of it comes, you know, with the amount of focus and intensity they have to put in their lives and their jobs and their training to, you know, make all that money to, you know, do all that stuff in the hours. But it is what it is. But yeah, you know, you can make some serious amounts of money. Um, let me grab super chat right here and I'll go to number six in a second. How can I reinvent myself from being a loser without changing where I live? I'll tell you what. Uh, Lemire, you call in when I drop the link to ask questions. All right. I'll put you up first. I'll put you at the front of the line and we'll dive into that one. Um, path number six, entrepreneurship. Now this is by far my favorite path and this can combine with other paths as well. Like you can combine path six, which is entrepreneurship with paths number three, for example, a personal influence. Uh, you can be an entrepreneur and also be an influential person out there as well that also has other opportunities too. So some of these, you know, can blend up a little bit. But entrepreneurship as a whole, in my estimation, aside from one of these fruitcakes that can some, sometimes ascend the ranks of influence very, very quickly within a few years, I think entrepreneurship is one of those other things that you can make lots of money very quickly within a few years if you tackle it correctly. Okay, I'm going to say that again. If you do it the right way, you can make lots of money, have lots of freedom and lots of control over your life. Um, I think all of these items that I've, all of these paths that I've presented to you, and I'm going to be adding a chapter in my book on, on, on the follow-up book on these six paths and get into detail with some, with some strong examples. So it's in at least paper form. It's in written form because who the hell knows what happens to the internet, my channel in the future. But I'll make sure that I put a chapter in the book on this, expanding on a little bit further. But entrepreneurship, in my estimation, is the best path. It is a path that I chose. Uh, C-suite job. I worked in the credit and collection industry. I worked for one of um, Canada's largest collection agencies. And I think the world's definitely top four or five. It was huge. Uh, they got bought, bought out... I think halfway through the term that I was working there, we had mentorship, we had monthly meetings, like fully structured, hundreds and hundreds of employees. Um, but there was only one CEO. I had the opportunity to mentor with the CEO 
And I came to the realization, the amount of work, and he was old too. He was like well into his 60s. I think he was in his early 60s or something like that. Uh, you come to the realization that there's a lot of people out there that would like to have that job or maybe trying to compete for it. And even in the management rank, there was probably, you know, we would have monthly meetings and probably easily 14, 15 between the VPs, the president, and, you know, the managers of each department, about 14, 15 people at each table. And each one of these guys was swinging dick, trying to, you know, vying for the top position of the company, you know, try to prove themselves. So, you know, you're doing a lot of chasing on that one. And I don't th think with the exception of one guy that actually made it to a, a, a C-suite job in the States, um, you know, got hired down there. It was actually, it was actually my boss at the time. Um, he was the same guy that I talk about in the chapter of my book, you know, um, hire slowly, fire quickly sort of stuff, you know, within those notions, but he did, he did well for himself. The other guys, nothing, you know, just same thing, you know, just moved to another company manager sort of thing. So they don't ascend very, very easily. Me, on the other hand, I chose a path of entrepreneurship and I created a company that settles debt for people, uh, saved them well over a quarter billion dollars in, um, credit card debt and we of course charge a, a, a fee for that you know because we provide the service and we save the money um and it still exists today it's 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 one of the few companies actually um we opened it up it's just over 20 years now surprisingly I completely forgot about it because we opened it up february 8th 2003 and we're 2023 right now so the company's now over 20 years old i don't get involved in the day-to-day -day stuff anymore i did an earn out buy it with my brother but i still consult and stuff like that but the fact of the matter is entrepreneurship, in my estimation, is the best path to life-changing money and wealth and freedom too, by the way. You don't have freedom in a C-suite job. You don't. You have to comply with the narrative of the organization, where they want to take the company, if they want to insert or infuse wokeness into it, which is something I never dealt with in that space. I mean, I haven't been employed for close to 20 years now. Uh, I've not been an employee of anybody for that long and uh, actually more than 20 years because I've, you know, the company started up February 2003. I've just not done that for that long and I have complete flexibility. I, I can literally say whatever I want. I, I say, go fuck yourself or I'm not into wokeness. That, that guy over there is a fruitcake or whatever. But the president or the CEO of a company, a CTO of a company can't do that. And if corporate, you know, the, the conglomerate, corporate of chair people say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to hire fruitcakes to promote our light beer or, you know, uh, like a razor company, you know, for example, might say, you know, let's just shit on men on this one. And you may not agree with it, but you have to do it. Right. So you don't have all the freedom in the world in path number one, as a C C-suite professional, you definitely don't have it as a licensed professional. There's a code of conduct that licensed professionals have to follow by their governing body. Um, here in uh, Ontario, for example, uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada is the governing body, essentially, that, that informs a code of conduct for lawyers. Uh, they can't behave in a certain way. It's why they always dress a certain way. They always dress professionally, uh, or they almost always dress you know, professionally in nice clothing with you know, jackets and stuff like that. Um, they can't say and do certain things Again, you don't have certain freedoms, which I believe that you can have as an entrepreneur. Um, I've had people try to cancel me legitimately. Like I've, I've, I've said things on Twitter. Um, what are the ones that I can remember a few years ago that they tried to use against me was, it was something simple like, um, you know, here's five or six ways to, you know, keep a man. Standard stuff like, you know, have a low notch count, don't be obese, but you know, you say things like that, you know, don't be a single mom, know how to cook, you know, be, uh, be, you know, be a compliment, you know, to his life. Like God for, forbid that you say things that your grandparents would have said to, you know, your mom or your dad when they were growing up, you know, sort of thing. And, um, you know, I got threats. I got lots of threats that put it on like news and uh, publication leads and all this kind of shit. And people were like, man, I'm going to get you fired. I'm going to call your, call your boss and get you fired to the total debt free. It's like, idiot i like i am the i am the company you can't fire me retard like this this is the flexibility that you can have when you create your own business so again this is one of the other things that i find you know to be 
freeing and that I enjoy with path number six. The other thing too that we saw recently in the last couple of years with this whole scandemic thing is what happened was they started to lock us down. They took away our freedoms and our rights and our privileges that we've always, always had. Then they said, well, you need to take this experimental jibbity juice sort of thing. Otherwise we're going to fire you. I had, I had people like up in my DMs going, what am I going to do? You know, I've got a mortgage to pay and a family to feed. And like, what am I supposed to do? My company's going to fire me. And it's like, what do you want me to tell you? You know, like when you're, when you're a part of the system, when you're, when you're a cog in the wheel and like, you can't just get off the wheel and say, you know, well, I quit. Some people did. Very few did though. But most people are like, I'm just going to go along with it to, I'm going to go along to get along sort of thing. So I don't lose my job and my wife doesn't scream at me and, you know, my kids have a roof over their head. I get it. I get it. But I didn't have to do any of those things, you know. Um, there's certain freedoms and flexibilities that you have. You can pay yourself what you want, literally. You have you have a great year. The business is running well. Lots of lots of sales receipts. Okay, no problem. There's other, there's other uh, facilities and instruments that you can use as well, too. Um, not as many in Canada as there are in the United States, but tax write-offs, things that you can expense, um, ways to move money from a company to a hold code or a family trust to like, there's all these different uh, instruments that you can use that licensed legal professionals or licensed accountants, by the way, will help you maneuver. And as they maneuver them around, they also take a percentage of that because that's what they do to earn their money. But as an entrepreneur, you can do all those things. If if you set up the business correctly, so, there, so there's two kinds of businesses. Most people don't know this, right? There's, there's only really two different kinds of businesses. There's easy, lucrative, and fun businesses. This is called the ELF model. This is this is something that I didn't invent, by the way. I'm just I'm just parroting this or or paraphrasing it because uh, the I Love Marketing podcast was something that I used to listen to. Uh, 2007, 8, 9, uh, with Joe Polish and Dean Jackson, great podcasts. Um, and it, it became very, very clear that if, if you're going to run a business model, you want to do something that's easy, lucrative, and fun. And there's ways that you can engineer, by the way. Most people default, and my own you know, business, by the way, is more of a half business than an elf business. Half stands for hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. That was the other side of the equation. And that's what most of us do. That's what I did when I set up that business in 2003. Get computers, get a server, buy cubicles, rent office space, have an IT guy, start hiring, you know, employees, um, you know, doing all the standard stuff that you think you're doing. You know, if you're, if you're a brick and mortar guy, you're going to have a storefront with a neon open sign sort of thing. We had office space. We didn't need the neon open sign, but, you know, we paid for signage and stuff like that on the doors. We wrapped a vehicle. You know, there's all these things that we did, but if I was still running that business today in today's environment with what was required during the scamdemic, you know, for example, I wouldn't have been happy with that. You know, I can tell you right now, um, I, I saw the writing on the wall around 2014 or so. And I was like, it's time to transition out of this. And I went on to something else and. Here I am, you know, still creating on YouTube. I've written a book. I still podcast this stuff. Stick a camera in my car, get that GoPro, and I just just riff off, you know, different ideas. And you guys like them, you know. I've created a community around it. Um, entrepreneurship is a very, very powerful way to build a life that you want if you take the right path. Right? There's elements to this. Now, I said this at the start of the show. If you're on my email list, you'll get notification of the School of Entrepreneurship course when it opens up next Monday. Um, I talk about all the elements in the course. Um, you'll get some emails that'll break down exactly what the elements are and how they all work. Uh, you'll see the information that's in the course when you can get it and all that sort of stuff. But I want you to take note of this because this is becoming the ultimate path to flexibility, freedom, and wealth in the future. Um, countries and governments and provinces and states, you don't want to aim to plant and set your roots in one area. 
smart entrepreneurs, smart people, in fact, not just entrepreneurs, but smart people have figured out that you want to be, you want several passports, right? You want the ability to maneuver. Uh, you don't own your passport, by the way. If Justin Trudeau says, hey, Rich, screw you, I'm going to take, I'm going to take away your passport. It says to take away. It's not mine. It doesn't matter. It's got my picture in it that I paid for it, that I stood in the lineup for four fucking hours to get the damn thing. It's not mine. You can take it away. But guess what? I got other passports so I can still travel, right? So it's always it's always good to have multiple passports. It's always good to, if you're going to structure a business, that you don't structure it where it's anchored to a location. You don't want to be anchored by uh, a physical product, okay, and and or a location. If you build a business that's built around information, uh, content, for example, you know, entertainment. Uh, if you build a business around uh, something that's got subscription revenue built into it, sort of thing, um, and location independent, by the way, which is which just simply means you can run it from anywhere in the world. You know, if I want to take my laptop, uh, this camera, a little bit of lighting, and you know, take take this microphone and package it up and get a Starlink uh, and do this from a 60 foot sailboat in the middle of the Pacific ocean on my way to Fiji, I could legitimately do that. Right. Um, so you don't have those, you don't have that flexibility or, you know, those abilities. If you're in STEM, if you're in high ticket sales, if you're a licensed professional working for, uh, you know, medical facility, if you're a lawyer, if you're an accountant, stuff like that, if you're the CEO of a company, you don't have any of that freedom. So those are the six main paths. What I'll do is I think next Monday, I'll spend a little more time diving into um, entrepreneurship, the content in the School of Entrepreneurship. Um, it's a great course. There's been a lot of people that have gone through the material. Some people are actually doing some really interesting things. Um, we do monthly Zoom calls, you know, within the uh, course content and uh, chop up ideas. It's, you know, it's been a lot of fun. So um, you know, I hope you guys take a look at it. The course will launch next Monday. Um, it's going to kick off at 1997. If you're on the email list, uh, there'll be an opportunity to opt in on uh, launch date, which will be the sale date, um, with a $500 discount paying with crypto. So all those, all that information will be on the email list. So again, make sure you're on the email list to get all that. So let's switch over and start taking some call-ins because I don't want to ramble on more than 50% of the show. We're already 40 minutes in. Um, Let's see what church the church of petrol now that's that's a name that i can get behind can somebody who's failed at a normie car sales still succeed a high-end car or boat sales um i don't know why did you fail at normie car sales here call in here let me grab the link um and by the way if you have a channel i'm, I'm told now you can stream to your own death your own destination through this link too i know jaron does it off the general show uh, i'm gonna switch this over and let's go over here. Okay, so call in and ask a question. Okay, so that's the StreamYard link. I'm posting that to YouTube only. So make sure you head over to YouTube if you want to get that link, and I'll pin it up to the top. Um, and we'll get into some Q&A. Uh, yeah, Chris has the course. Thank you kindly, Chris. He highly recommends it. Um, one of the problems with a job, job J O B is in my estimate, in my estimation, it's an acronym. Uh, it doesn't mean you have a job. It stands for just over broke. J O B stands for just over broke. I'm going to stand up so we can switch over to the call-ins over here. Uh, so this mic up here a little bit. Again, the link is there. You guys can uh, drop in and hop in with that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll break it down a little bit further for you guys next Monday with the um, with the next cast that I do, uh, providing I don't get my ass handed to me this Saturday. I'm doing my first fight this Saturday, so hopefully um, I come out of it on top. <laughs> Uh, let me grab the ad reel and then we'll get into the Q and A in just one second. Where is it? 
There we go. This episode is brought to you by the Unplugged Alpha Supplements and Grondike Soap Company. Brothers, if you're like me and you take what you put in your body seriously, you'll want to use the Unplugged Alpha Supplements. An obsession with absorption is what sets this line apart from the others. You want to make sure that you absorb as much of the supplements as possible so you don't end up peeing out expensive urine. My supplement line is made in the United States from the highest quality domestic ingredients. And unlike cheaper supplements from China and plastic bottles, Mine ship in dark glass bottles to keep your supplements fresher, longer, and won't seep endocrine disrupting plastics into your supplements. Nothing is a hard tablet. Everything is in an easily digestible, bioavailable capsule. You can filter all products by various categories, including testosterone support, estrogen metabolism, fat burning, immune health, sleep support, and performance. Visit theunpluggedalpha.com forward slash shop and use the subscribe and save option to get 10% off your supplement orders or use coupon code alpha10 for 10% off a one-time order to try it out. Then I use Tactical Soap and God of War beard oil every day. Tactical Soap is a handmade product made in the United States from ingredients you can actually pronounce, not conventional endocrine lowering toiletry chemicals. Both the soap and the beard oils are infused with bioidentical pheromones that are designed by a clinical psychologist and pheromone expert to maximize attractiveness, to the opposite sex. Go visit coopersoap.com and get 10% off your order today. Guys, check out my website at richcooper.ca for more information on booking me for coaching, my community, my courses, and a whole bunch more. You can also find all the useful links pinned below in the top YouTube comment of all my videos. Now let's get on with the show. All right, let's get on with the show. Okay, we got Lair Lemaire. So here, here's this question. We'll add him to the stream and we'll start with this question first. So can you give me a little bit of background behind this? Hi, Rich. It's an honor. Uh, you're just a, a great inspiration, uh, especially to all of us in the United States. Uh, basically, I live in South Florida and I have uh, repeatedly let down my boss. It's my first professional job I've had. I uh, don't have a college background. It's uh, uh, something I kind of locked into. Uh, just an assistant role and uh, just constant, constant screw ups. And uh, it's starting to really affect my reputation, not just here at my job, but also locally in South Florida. What kind of screw ups are we talking about here? Like, like what are we doing wrong? Uh, yeah, behavioral, behavioral screw ups. Okay. Yeah. Lateness, okay. tardiness, errors. So. Okay, so lateness, tardiness, and errors are character traits. And I mean, if you want to reinvent yourself, why can't you reinvent yourself with the existing company and show up in time and not make the errors and stuff like that? Uh, some of them are really severe. Uh, Did they terminate you? Did they discipline you? Like, what do they do as a consequence of them? Uh, well, being passed over for promotion uh, basically mm -hmm. is the punishment. It's kind of... Uh, uh also shame too mm -hmm. yeah and, and like something as simple as being on time like why like why are you showing up late uh yeah this is kind of like a following up on your video you did a while ago about the friend you had uh with problems i got i have uh like vices um habitual problems uh tried going to group to uh get over it and um what kind of vices we're talking like alcohol drugs weed like no what? uh no uh like adult material online that's porn. okay yeah so you're showing up late to work because of porn yeah nervousness and that pretty much yeah, yeah, yeah well look man i mean this is gonna follow you wherever you go you, you know until you deal with this 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 um like as somebody that's been an employer uh you know whether i was an employee at a company as a manager or when i was running my own company as an entrepreneur um tardiness to me is disrespectful like um whenever i set a time like i'm you guys probably noticed if you've watched me for a while I, I i almost always kick off my show when it's scheduled for right and if i can't kick off my show for the scheduled time i usually pull push it back like you know 10 or 15 minutes and it might be because my guest is late or my computer's fucked up and i got to reboot or something like that but uh, like i learned this lesson as a young man because and i'll tell you the story um 
I didn't have any respect for my dad's time. And we used to go to the mall when I was in elementary school and he would go get the groceries and he said, you know, I'll be done in 25 minutes. Meet me here at the exit in 25 minutes. And I would go down to the arcade and I play video games. Um, and one time, you know, I don't know, I was probably doing well in the video game and I didn't want to lose my score and I kept playing and I was late and I made my dad wait like two minutes and he was pissed. He said to me, look, you don't respect my time when you show up late. In future, there's going to be a penalty if you're ever late again. I'm going to charge you 25 cents for every whatever it was, like 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. And I, I thought to myself, okay, fine, you know, whatever. Next time that I was late, he charged me. I was, I was never late again after that because there was a financial penalty. You know, there's a consequence to that. And that was over a video game. It, like video games are just as addictive as anything else, right? Like there's a reason why we sit in front of our screens doing this shit for fucking hours at a time, you know, getting to the next level because we're addicted to that shit because it draws you in. It's like, oh, I can level up. I can get better armor. I can get more whatever. And it's like, you know, this whole path to leveling up in a pretend world when we should be leveling up in real life. And when you come to the realization that you should be leveling up in real life and that's more important than the pretend world or some make-believe shit that's going on in your head, then you take real life seriously. I don't know what to tell you, man. It's like it's like one of those, like these are basic fundamental concepts that I think high value men need to understand. And even if you're not a high value man, if you want to improve your life, like your question is, how do I reinvent myself from being a loser without changing where I live? Like changing where you live, still still doing, still adopting and behaving in loserous, you know, sort of ways is going to be the same thing if you do it in California, New York, Chicago. Florida, it doesn't matter. You know, you're still going to do the same stuff. You have to change your belief system. Change in the outside world starts from a belief system. Belief systems govern the choices that we make. When we make those choices, we get results as a, as a, as a consequence of those choices. A simple game that you can play when you go to the grocery store, when you're in the checkout line and you see what people take out of their buggy and they put on the conveyor belt and they buy is take a look at what they look like and then see what's on the conveyor belt that they're buying. There's always a direct correlation between the choice that they make when they walk through the store and put that stuff from the buggy on the conveyor belt and they take it home and they put it in their face and they eat it, right? I go through the exact same store that they do, but I look like this at my age rather than what they look like at their age, which is usually younger than me and it looks like shit. So it's, it's, it's beliefs that I hold for myself for the kind of man that I want to be, the kind of life that I want to live, the kind of uh, impression that I want to leave you guys with what I'm all about. When people see me in real life and they come up to me, they're, you know, I am who I am and they, and they recognize me and I'm acknowledged for that. And that's not important because I want to impress people. That's important for me because that's who I am. That is, that is part of my belief. I don't believe that it is acceptable to be out of shape, to be incompetent, to be slouchy, to be dressed poorly, to walk around with clothes with spaghetti stains or something like that on it. I I have certain standards and certain beliefs. And if you want to get better results, like if you want to reinvent yourself, the simple answer to that is raise your standards. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Once you raise your standards, you're going to have a different set of beliefs that you're going to hold to yourself and you're going to make different choices. You're going to prioritize, well, my shift starts at 8. I'm there at 8 or I'm there before 8. I'm there, you know, well before 8 or whatever it happens to be. Because that's your priority because you've raised your standards now. Does that make sense? Yes it does. Yes it does. That's where I would start, my man. Thank you, Rich. Thank All you. All right, buddy. Take care. All right. Um the other guy that dropped the question, Church of Petrol, I think, failed a car sales. Church of Petrol, if you're there. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. You know, I actually prefer doing it this way. So if you guys super chat and then you come in, I'll I'll handle you guys first, right? You know, it's only fair. So Church of Petrol, here he is. And he said, can someone who's failed at Normie car sales still succeed at high-end car or boat sales? Okay, so what's happening in Normie car sales for you? Hey, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of like you, I'm a huge car guy. 
like always loved cars since I can remember. Uh, been racing for a few years, but yeah, obviously that only goes so far when you only have so much money. Um, yeah. So a few years ago, I mean, it's funny you mentioned Kias because that's actually what I started with. Uh, went to got sort of promoted over to the Honda side of this dealership. Um, couldn't get along with the boss. He found a stupid reason to fire me. Uh, but I mean, I was on the way out anyway. And then uh, went over to a large uh, Ford corporate, you know, big corporate dealership kind of Ford store. And did okay. I mean, I like their cars. This is when they had, you know, everything from the Fiesta ST up to the GT, mm-hmm. you know. But everybody comes in and buys Escapes. Yeah. And it's like, it's just hard to relate, for, yeah. I think, for someone like me. Yeah. Um, even though, you know, I, I'm personable. I can make a friend. You know, I can kind of kind of take the training and do it, um, you know, it didn't always work. And then I had a couple, I had one guy particularly who like really, really, really used my time. And he was like, he kind of came at me like, Hey, you know, I got this Camaro I take to the local track too. And we know some of the same people and like, you know, we're kind of kindred spirits. Mm-hmm. And then dude called me on my day off and he was like, Hey, I'm going to buy this from your competitor. If you don't get down here right now if you don't give me a better offer right now. And of course I call the manager manager goes, he just needs to come in. I'm like, he's not not coming in. We're going to lose the deal if you don't do something. And I just kind of like lost my confidence after that. (laughs) So, um, I've just, I have a unique opportunity in my life to kind of change career, kind of change careers. Um, so, and like, have like, like, are you good with stats and data like around the vehicle? Like, are you the kind of guy that knows the compression ratio of a 1990 Ford Mustang GT? Probably about eight to one, isn't it? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> sometimes. One, hey, not too, not too, not too bad. Um, um, yeah. So, so the reason why I say that is a lot of the times when you get into high end car sales, you know, for example, like exotic cars, um, I want to know. Like I already know a lot about cars anyway, because I'll sit there and I'll research the shit out of a car. Like, like that's just me. Like I'm already, I've already been shopping for my next car, and I'm researching the shit out of anything that I'm that I'm contemplating right now. So when I go to the dealer, like I was looking at a car the other day, right? And I'm looking at this car, and you know, I say to the salesperson, I say, you know, is this the one with the with the air suspension, right? And they don't know the answer to that. Or they, or they kind of bullshit their way through it. I'm the kind of guy that's like, you know what? Fuck these guys. I don't want to buy it from this person. I'm going to find somebody else to buy it from that actually knows what they're talking about, right? And a lot of my friends are the same way. You know, when they're when they're looking at high high price point things or you know high price point cars or exotic cars. I don't know about boats because I've never bought a boat. I I just have a boat club membership, so I just I don't want to deal with the boat ownership shit. I just want to show up, pay a monthly fee and just drive the boat and drop it off. Be like, here, you guys deal with the fucking hole in the water sort of thing. So you might want to take a stab at it, man. You know, find a brand that you like that you're familiar with and just go into the sales manager and say, hey, man, you know, I got lots of car, you know, car sales experience. I love this brand. Um, you know, whatever, you know, I've got some experience with it. I've, I've got friends that own these cars. I know them like the back of my hand. I'd love to take, you know, I'd love for you to give me an opportunity at selling your, you know, cars to customers. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have to show up looking like you're a salesman for the brand because you're a representation of the brand too, right? So, I mean, you don't want your typical Kia Ford sales guy showing up at Ferrari or McLaren trying to sell their cars looking like the Kia or Ford sales guy. You got to you got to look the part of what the McLaren guy or the or the Ferrari guy, you know, sales guy looks like. So you just have to sort of act as if, if you know what I mean. I, I mean, I present myself really well. Like my, even though I'm kind of my cars are, you know, I got like my, I got an old BMW that I daily and I got my Miata track car. My friends were always the kind of like Porsche guy, guys that are buying, you know, Boxster spiders and, you know, GT fours and stuff. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I, I present, I mean, it's one strength I do have is that I present myself well. Yeah. Uh, but to answer your, your earlier question, I definitely, I don't, try to if i don't know if you ask me a direct question especially if i think you probably know the answer i'm just, i'm not gonna bullshit you man i'm just yeah. gonna be like but i'm just gonna most, be like no i'll be like no i'm gonna no but i can find that out for you that's, that's how me. that's how most of the guys are they just bullshit or they lie or they just don't know 
or they don't care. Probably, probably because most people yeah, don't totally. like to ask, you know, stuff like that. Like you've noticed when people go into a Ford dealer, they're mostly buying, you know, escapes or something like that. Just basic average fucking, you know, platinum edition, whatever, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. they, they don't care about much of the details. So take a stab at it, you know, like, why not? You know, if you like cars, you have a genuine interest in it. Uh, like. I, I like buying stuff from people that also have an interest in the product that I'm looking at as well, too. And I think I've got a friend out here. So I live in Denver and I got a friend out here who's starting an exotic dealership. And I was at a little yeah. car, little car show a couple weekends ago. And it's kind of your standard fare, you know, some BMWs, some, you know, Dodges or whatever. And I look around the corner, there's a 996 GT3 RS sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God. And my first reaction is that's probably fake. And I see, but I see the guy standing next to it. I'm like, oh, that's my, that's my buddy that I haven't talked to in years. I'm like, there's no way he would have a fake one. And he, and he had a Ferrari 430 next to it. And he's like, yeah, I'm uh, starting this dealer, starting this dealership, man. And we ended up talking about racing. He's a big, uh, he races at the Nürburgring. He figures he has the most laps of any American. And that's also a dream of mine is to race in the Nürburgring 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So he was like, Hey, he was like, dude, I could definitely get you a ride. If you like get some like experience, like some real there racing experience here in the States. So it's kind of reinvigorated me a little bit. So, yeah. So sell, so sell brands that you like, man, you know, sell some higher price point brands that you like, you know, if you're into boats get into boats and start selling boats. I also do like sailing. So yeah, that's why, that's why I mentioned it, but yeah, I mean, sailboats yeah. aren't aren't cheap what's the price point of an average sailboat four or five hundred thousand dollars even just yeah a quarter million for like a 40 footer for yeah. like a beneto or something yeah it's mm -hmm. crazy yeah all right man appreciate it all right good luck with that all right appreciate it man see you, see you brother all right um steven here says is creating a company and intimate family relationship wife and intimate family relationship is a significantly more impactful experience than simply having a beautiful relationship with a friend, LTR, and a local community. Um, that depends. It depends on your wife. <laughs> she could be the most miserable choice in your entire life, bro. It could be the worst thing you ever do, uh, quite literally. So that's that's entirely dependent on you know who you decide to you know put a ring on her finger and a baby in her belly. So careful oh hang on i think we got steve here in the background steve steve is that you is that is that your question yes yeah rich all right yeah thanks for having me. yeah that's me can you hear me all right yeah yeah okay you got a little more hair in this picture over here it looks like you shaved your head since okay yeah so yeah i've got monk mode literally um, okay. I, I, uh, I became red pill like many folks after going through a divorce. So, you know, I'm in my early forties at this point, but, you know, I got my money right, had a successful career in, um, you know, in the capital markets. And so, you know, I find a lot of inner peace with the meditation and, you know, everything that I've been in my life, but now I'm looking at, you know, the remainder of my life. It's like, what's the next mountain? To climb mm. and so i'm wondering is it worth kids? it to, to go out and you know create a family do you have kids right now no i don't have children okay no, so no. so your first marriage netted no children but you had the experience of the marriage didn't work out why didn't you have any kids with that wife Well, when it, that's when the rubber came to the road, when it was time to, you know, have kids after married for a few years and it was like, okay, now it's time to have children. That's when she decided she wanted to have a divorce and, you know, try to take my wealth from me. So, mm. um, it was a bad choice in the beginning, but, uh, yeah, well, for me, it's not something that I really have a burning desire, but it just seemed what else to do. Cause I'm not really motivated much by material things I have, you know, I have a nice car. I have nice, I have all the things that I would want you're not really wanting for more, but that's why I wonder if focusing on relationships is sort of the next, the next month. It's worth Let me get you just, you know, to um, run that risk to roll the dice. Like you're saying, with picking the right Steve, woman. Steve, uh, let me just stop you for a sec. Let me just get you to roll your cursor down to the bottom and hit stop cam just to kill your video feed. Um, because the audio keeps breaking up. I, 
I need the audio more than I need the video, just so I can hear what you're saying. So just kill the video. There you go. All right, let's try that again. So um, you're how old right now? I'm 41. Okay. And is kids something that you want or is so it like you're boring and you're thinking that's the only money thing in the capital markets? He retired. I'm, I'm effectively. It's kind of that I'm bored. You know, I am still active in the markets to do with my yeah. time, but none of these things are like long term projects, if you know what I mean. Where do so you live? I'm looking for something to, you know, spend 10 years doing. Okay. Where do you live, man? I live in Tennessee. Okay. Um, that's a father friendly state. So that's good. Um, I think shared custody is default there. So you probably wouldn't have to fight over that. Um, you would, you would want to spend a couple of years vetting the, uh, chick. So the standard protocol for your ask is really spin some plates, uh, let the cream rise to the top. She's going to, at some point say, Steve, I dig your vibe. I want to claim you. I don't want to share you sort of thing. I'm looking for something serious. When that gal shows up, then you take a look at her. You take a serious look at her. You see if she's got, you know, a bunch of red flags or not. If she doesn't then you can decide at the time, okay, I'm still kind of interested in kids. She's young enough to have kids. She doesn't have any red flags. I like her. We get along. And then you want to date her for a couple of years, year and a half to two years, because women can act for, I think um, my psychiatrist friend, Sean, said that they can act for about a year and a half to two years. So you want to date them for about a year and a half to two years, travel, see how she handles stress. Um you know, difficult situations. She if, see if she has the bright, the bright triad traits rather than the dark triad traits. And if it looks good, then put some babies in her. You know, if you want to have some kids, um, I'm not a big fan of marriage, so I wouldn't do it. You know, by inviting the state in my house and a ceremony and all that sort of stuff. But you can have children with the women. You know, if you like her, you know she's good to you. She crosses off. You know, she ticks all the boxes. She doesn't have red flags. Sure. You know, if that's what you want, then do it. But um, I would structure your wealth in such a way that there's some distance between you and problems. Because you live in a state where it's shared custody by default. Um, what's that footballer's name? Hakimi? You heard about this guy? Yeah. So he had nothing in his name. Now, if you're with a, a chick, you're dating her for two, three years, and then you know she's pregnant all of a sudden... Uh, and halfway through the pregnancy, you move all of your assets out of your name into your mom's name. And then the marriage doesn't work out five, six years later. And you've got three kids because you did that to clearly and obviously protect your assets before, um, you know, the first child was born during her pregnancy, the courts could turn back the clock on that. If she's got a good lawyer, depending on what the law says, where you live, right? So from, from day one, before you get married. You might want to structure your wealth in such a way that it's protected. And you can talk to a family lawyer about how to do that in your state, but there's probably going to be some options that will be presented to you. You see what I'm saying? Like as far as the wealth part goes, but what you're really doing is you're vetting her for mother stock. Yeah, I, I appreciate the practical tips on the wealth and the vetting process. And, and I've heard you talk about this before. I guess my real question for you, because you've talked about how you, you know, you have offspring is is that dynamic that relationship you know having children is that is that really significantly different than just having meaningful relationships with with other people in your life whether that's your coworkers or your friends yeah it's totally you know? different yeah it's totally different i mean when you've got a child and you look at them it's funny there was a stand up comic that made a joke about this you know cuz i'm you know cuz i'm divorced so i can kind of relate he said something along the lines of you know you look at your kid and your kid half looks like you and half looks like somebody that you kind of hate right now. <laughs> um, but it, look, man, it's, you know, you pass on your name, you pass on your legacy, you pass on your genetic uh, code. Um, it is the reason why we are on the earth to scatter seed and do this. Um, it's, it's totally different from friendships. Like you'll probably find that friendships and network and community and doing stuff that you're like, I love going on supercar rallies with my friends. I just love it. It's 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 one of my favorite things to do. I I wish I could do it every day. 
Um, but watching a bunch of, you know, tween girls playing baseball, it's my duty as a father to participate in that and to do the driving around and haul the shit and, you know, bring kids around if I got a sort of thing. But it's not as fun as hanging out with my friends driving, you know, in supercar rallies. Just isn't. So uh, it's just a different kind of fulfillment. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't know what you mean. What, right. What you but mean, it, but yeah, it, but, but it is a different kind of fulfillment that you can't experience having great relationships and friendships with other guys or other communities that you're involved in that you like. It doesn't matter if it's like model building or golfing or whatever that, you know, that thing happens to be that you build it around. Uh, I think children are just different in that sense. And it's a moving target. Small children are wonderful. Um, from the age of, of, of birth to like two or three sucks. The first couple of years blow diapers, screaming all night, just sucks. Okay. And then they start to have a little bit of a character and they're fun and you take them to the park. And from that age up to about seven, eight, nine, ten cool and then they kind of like move into that period where they're turning into like more of an adult and you don't matter so much anymore you're now a taxi service you're an atm you're uh you know can i stay out over here and do this with this person and they're looking for permission if they don't like it they get all hissy and shit like that and then your job is to parent you know your job is to set boundaries and guidelines around that child so they have the uh, potential to, to to do something useful with their life to make you proud you know what I mean? Um, so it's a lot of work and it's a lot of fighting too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing your experience and Rich, thanks for everything you do. I really appreciate you. You're welcome, Steve. And I, uh, you know, hope you get and do whatever it is that you want that, uh, you know, fills your cup, my man. All right. The key Thank thing you. is though, is, is don't have kids just to have kids. I'm going to tell you this, you know, be, before you go, have kids with the right woman, make sure that you select the mother stock correctly, because that will make your experience that could make your experience a fucking living nightmare, a complete hell to absolute bliss. I know I know guys that are still married to their wives, their, their kids are all adults, they've got great family, everybody's wonderful sort of thing. It's rare, but it takes it takes the right man in the right masculine role to lead and the right woman to want to follow that leader, if you know what I mean, and to be a complement to his life and like there's a lot of things to contemplate. You know, if you have small kids and you've got the means, I wouldn't put them in the school system. I would homeschool them and I would have a mother that was willing to homeschool them. So, I mean, if I could go back in a time machine and do it over again, I would certainly set a certain list of parameters and prerequisites that would need to be met if I were to ever have kids with a chick. Otherwise, she would just be for fun or she would just be for entertainment or something casual. And I'd have other chicks on a go and I'd wait for, you know, which one to like stand out and be obvious to me that would be good mother stock. Yeah. It's yeah, a lot of work. I learned that the hard way, you know, with the divorce. But yeah. I find it's it's easy to spin plates now, you know. Um, but it's when I think about it realistically from a timeline perspective, you know, I'm already in my early 40s, finding good mother stock, you know, with the age gap difference and then taking the time to vet them and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, this really kind of pushes it out. So I'm just wondering you know, do I put effort into something that may that might might not have a high probability of materializing, or do I just continue to chase excellence? You know, in business and um, you know internal experience. I wouldn't chase women. I would chase excellence. And if you're dating anyway, like, is that what you're doing? Well, I mean, I I travel around the world, so mm -hmm. you know, as I travel around, I got you know different women I talk to in different place parts of the world mm. but i i literally live in an ashram when i i'm in monk mode like for real mm -hmm. like i i spend hours a day meditating mm -hmm. um you know i live in a community and it's really great and with the rest of the time i spend you know pursuing excellence in my business career mm -hmm. it's a unique situation i have here but you it's not the best opportunity to like meet yeah. women on a daily up here yeah you would be a really good candidate for my 1% community. I've got lots of really good members in Tennessee, dude. Uh, there's there's some very good friends of mine that live in Tennessee that would get along great with a guy like you. So, um, I mean, if you're looking for community, if you're looking for a lot of like-minded men that you can chop up ideas like this and do more than just what you're at right now, then I would definitely get into that. That's, that's always pinned in the top comment of my uh, videos. But... Um, you sound like a solid dude that's asking the right questions. I would I would keep chasing the excellence. Obviously, you like women, so date women. 
Um, you're going to have to make some changes on how to do that a little bit better. Um, and then if it's, it's obvious and clear that you've got a woman in your life that's worthy of putting babies in, then contemplate it then, but only after you test her for a few years to see how she stacks up because women today are not like, <laughs> we, we have to work today as men, probably two, three, four, five times as hard to get a woman that's half as good as what my granddad got. Honestly, dude, women today aren't as good as what our grandfathers, you know, could get. And, uh, they're a little messed up with the lifestyle choices and everything that they've gone through, you know, sort of their younger, more formative years, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I hear you. Rich, you've been gracious with your time. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Steve. Take care. Okay. Let's see what we got here in the chat. Um, Divine Insurgent, since you are into autos and lamenting the trends of electric vehicles, what are your thoughts on hybrid cars? Uh, why don't the climate freaks endorse that as a compromise since so many can't buy EVs? That is a great question. Are you in the uh, are you in the waiting area to chop this up? I don't see divergence in there. Okay, so let me deal with this. Um, I'm not a big fan of electric vehicles. I don't think that pure electric vehicles are a good idea for a whole bunch of reasons. They're heavy as shit, okay? You need to carry around loads of, of battery in a car to get three, four, you know, 100 kilometers of range. Um, and that shit's heavy. And they don't perform well in handling characteristics. They, I've seen electric cars in the wintertime with snow tires, uh, keeping the same distance from the vehicle in front of them. And when they have to like stop or, or they have to slam on the brakes because something happens with a car in front of them, they just keep going because heavy things in motion like to keep doing what they're already doing. So in my view, in my estimation, there's a lot of downsides still with electric cars. I'm sure they'll get better over time. They're also not net positive to the fucking environment. That That's a lie that they've been telling us for years now. Um, I shared a TED Talk on my Twitter feed um, er earlier today. You can go see it. It's it's like, it's a clip. It's got like four or five minutes long. So I'm not going to play the whole thing. You can go find it. You may have already seen it. But essentially, electric cars aren't positive to the environment if they have a large battery until well over 100,000 miles, not kilometers for my Canadian friends, but miles for my American friends, okay? Um, and even then, it's only slightly marginal because of the way they have to mine the battery raw materials and ship them around the world. Like there's fucking kids in the Congo dying, mining cobalt or whatever it is they got to dig out of the ground so that Greta Thunberg can virtue signal the world about, you know, how, how great her electric vehicles are. So, and the other thing too is, by the way, they have ways now of producing gasoline so that it's either net neutral or net negative from the environment. Um, I know Porsche just invested in a Chilean company that is that has a technology that lets them extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere using uh, the raw ingredients of water. You know, essentially, they just use like electrolysis with water, and they have scrubbers that take carbon dioxide out of the out of the atmosphere. They mix it with some hocus pocus engineering shit, and they end up with gasoline at the end of it, which is identical to the same, you know, dino juice that you have to mine out of the earth and refine and turn the oil and ship it around the world and all that kind of shit. Like these facilities can be placed just about anywhere. The technology isn't at the point where you can get it down to like three or four bucks a gallon. It's still too expensive. They're producing at about 40 bucks a gallon. Uh, but the technology exists and Porsche is investing money into this because they have a lot of people with high performance 911s and those things don't break. They last forever. So these customers are going to need gas for the cars when they try to take gas away from, uh, you know, people with electric cars. Um, so you can actually produce gasoline uh, either as a wash by taking it out of the atmosphere because you take it out and it goes back into the atmosphere, you know, through the tailpipe. Uh, there's also net negative ways of doing it. I have a guy that bought my school of entrepreneurship that's in the Zoom calls that actually has a net negative technology that he's working on right now. We were talking earlier today. Um, so these technologies exist. You don't really need battery powered cars or EVs. Um, and by the way, uh, that TED talk that is clipped there, it just talks about the manufacturing process of making the car. It doesn't talk about the source of electricity, which by the way, is not fucking windmills and solar panels like most people think. It's mostly from 
coal plants is where you get most of the electricity. So it's not, they're not as good for the environment or, you know, they're not saving the baby seals like everybody's, you know, trying to tell you. Um, and that's because they want to control you. They want to scare you. They want you to believe that, you know, sea levels are rising. The fucking rainforests are all burning down and all that shit. Climates change. I'm not saying climates don't change. Climates change. They've changed for fucking ever. They're going to continue to change. I just don't think that they're changing to the extent or to the regard that the mainstream media is purporting it to be. And I don't think that EVs have the positive impact on the environment that they're purporting them to have. They just don't. The numbers don't add up. I've looked at numbers. They don't add up. You might argue with me. You might disagree with me. I don't hate electric cars. I think the electrification of vehicles is inevitable. I like the electrification of vehicles. I think it's cool, uh, especially high performance cars. If you've ever driven the new Acura NSX or the McLaren Artura, um, these are technologies that improve the way that the vehicle performs. Uh, one of the vehicles that I was looking at, I was, you know, saying earlier that I'm looking at, you know, new vehicle, it's, it's a plug-in hybrid and it's got a smaller battery pack with a gas motor and combined power output is pretty high performance. And you can get like, depending on, you know, the build somewhere between 35 and 70 kilometers out of the battery pack alone. Um, there's a video that I saw on YouTube a couple of weeks ago. I think Matt Farah did it and he was talking about how, you know, you live in a city, you can drive through the city or out of the city, and then you, your battery's, you know, going to be depleted. You hop on the highway, you push the charge button in the car. And as you're driving, you know, you're 70 kilometers on the highway or whatever it is, you know, the distance you got to go, it recharges the battery. You get to the next city, you got a full battery again. So I think that the, that the blend of what this guy's talking about here, uh, thoughts on hybrid cars, I think that is probably the better medium of just gas or just electric because you don't need to haul around a massive heavy battery pack to get the benefit of 70 kilometers of driving before you can plug it in and charge it or charge it up with the car when you're on the highway as you're just driving with the alternator and you don't have to deal with like gas powered cars are inefficient in the city anyway because you're stopping and going stoplight and you use a lot of gas to move the car you know to get it rolling again um and electric cars or hybrid cars have the potential to recapture a lot of that energy with regenerative braking. So there's a lot of conversations around, you know, these notions of gas, electric, hybrid, you know, what do you do? Where do you go? Diesel, stuff like that. And I think personally, I think the best realistic use of it is a plug-in hybrid in today's world. Uh, but they keep telling us, oh, we got to go EVs. Sure. I mean, they're going to say what they're going to say. It is what it is anyway. Uh, so that's my take on that super chat. Uh, what's your opinion on walkable cities? I fucking hate cities. Uh, like if, if I could take all my shit, move into the country, buy a bunch of land. Um, but I can't, you know, I've got, I've got an obligation to parenting and, um, you know, when you get divorced, you generally stay where you're at. So you, you can consolidate and coordinate all that sort of stuff. But if I didn't have that, um, you know, holding me back. I'm just not a fan of cities or, you know, walkable cities, whatever that means. I just don't like them. And they're always filled with people that vote for policies and shit, stupid shit that I don't like. A lot of fruitcakes in, you know, big cities too. So not my thing, man. Um, anyway, you agree, you disagree. It is what it is. Here, let's go to uh, Huckleberry G. Huckleberry, what's up, buddy? Hey, Rich, how are you doing tonight? Good, man. What do you got for me? So I have a question about um, the process you use when evaluating uh, opportunities. Um, yeah. How do you evaluate what the highest chance of success is going to be when you're working through, you know, different opportunities you have in front of you? You're going to have to give me some examples of the opportunities. Like, what are we talking about here? So like if you have a couple different career paths, like some of the ones you've talked about tonight, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's two lines of thought of, you know, you can do anything type of mindset, like anything is possible. Mm -hmm. What if we're being realistic? You know, I'm 35, like the NBA ship has sailed for me. Like that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of things that are in between those levels of what's obvious um, between, you know, 
maybe something is achievable, but what's your highest probability of success? And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts or frameworks you use uh, when evaluating opportunities for yourself. Well, the kind of opportunities that I evaluate at this point in my life would be business opportunities, investment right. opportunities. Those are the okay. sorts of things that I evaluate. So I don't evaluate jobs. I'm not employable as far as I'm concerned. Nobody could hire me. I'd, I'd probably tell my boss to fuck off within the first couple of weeks because of some stupid woke narrative they'd want me to. They'd, they'd tell me that I, ha that I have to put my pronouns in my fucking email bio and I tell them to eat a dick and just move on sort of thing. So it's, right. <laughs> that's where I'm at in life, man. Um, so yeah. the sorts of opportunities that I got to evaluate are you know, is this going to make me a lot of money? Is this going to take up a lot of my time or a little bit of my time? So you have to identify what matters to you. Okay. Yeah. So you're at an epoch now, you're at a certain chapter of your life. So what matters to you? Right. So for me, it would be, it would have to make a lot of money. It would have to take up as little of my time as possible. It would definitely have to be an elf business. So I don't want to move a physical product. I don't want to be anchored to a location. I, it, it, it can't be like real estate based. Um, I would prefer something that's subscription revenue. So you have a customer, they're paying monthly over a long period of time. Uh, you're moving digital or information product. Or you're providing a service. You know, for example, I don't have to ship anything. Right. Um, right. Those would be the things that I would look at, at where I'm at in my stage of life. If I were to consider getting involved in either an investment or a business opportunity. So you have to get clear on what matters, you know, for you, right? Because with what you're looking at right now, it's completely different with what I'm looking at. So what's a priority for me is not going to be a priority for you. It's the same thing with women, right? Like when you're 40, like the guy earlier that was talking about, hey, you know, I'm doing well in life, but I'm contemplating, you know, having kids sort of thing. That's a different conversation from the 26-year-old guy that I talked to last week who's like, yeah. I don't really have a lot of experience with women. What do you think I should be doing? Here's here's what my goal is. So get clear and identify what your goal is and then make choices that are aligned with those goals. Absolutely. Makes okay. sense? Makes sense. Yes, sir. All right, man. All right. Appreciate it. See you, buddy. Huckleberry G. All right. Uh, I got some private chats here. I think I have time for one more. Um. Let's see here, X, what should I do if I want to transition from employee to entrepreneur, but haven't come up with ideas? Good question. Okay. X marks the spot. So your question here is, what should I do if I want to transition from employee to entrepreneur, but haven't come up with ideas that I think I could pursue full time? Can you give me a little bit of backstory on that? So why do you want to become an entrepreneur? Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually something that uh, I've always thought about, mm -hmm. but uh, I've just had a pretty rocky life so i've moved from country country to country okay and so like right now most of my time i spend in banking and then i moved on to digital assets i worked for a blockchain company and then i left mm -hmm. uh, because there were mass layoffs and so i went back to banking and now okay. like i just want to go and follow the entrepreneur path how old are you 35 where do you live toronto cool um what are you doing right now to cook up business ideas um, right now I, I'm just mainly researching, uh, investments actually. So that's most of my time outside of work. I just mm -hmm. uh, research a lot of blockchain projects and see, uh, where the, uh, next, uh, I guess, narrative lies in the next bull run. So first of all, um, I would definitely buy my course when it launches on May 1st, uh, because it answers exactly what it is you're talking about with about six hours worth of video lectures. And you also get the Zoom uh, calls for support monthly. Um, setting that aside, um, and offering you a freebie to at least give you something out of this, I would get myself a spiral. I would get something like this, maybe a little bit smaller, about half the size of that. Oops, about half the size of that from like the dollar store. Okay, cool. and keep it with you at your office. Keep it in your briefcase. Keep it in your car, or maybe get two or three of them. And keep a pen in it. And every time you see an opportunity, something that you're interested in, okay, like you love doing something like that, you're really good at it, and you think it'll make money. So when those three things will intersect, sorry, three things, when those three things intersect, you're really good at it, you're really interested in it, like you love doing stuff like that, and it has the potential to make lots of money, 
business idea. Do, 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 you know? Um, so you're in Toronto. So you probably remember like 30 years ago, we had, we had a couple of summers or there's at least one summer. Did you live here about 30 years ago? No, not 30 years ago. Came here. Okay. Well then I'll, t I'll tell you the story from the perspective of somebody that doesn't know, but about 30 years ago, we had this problem with tractor trailers with tires coming off the tractor trailers and they would just fly off in opposite tra traffic and go through the windshield of the car coming the other way and kill somebody. And this happened about two or three times. So whoever was maintaining these tractor trailers, they weren't torquing down the lug nuts properly and the wheels would come flying off. And I was like, well, that sucks. And there was no real solution to it. I was visiting England that summer and I noticed the tractor trailers in the UK on all the lorries, they call them lorries over there. They have these plastic little fucking things. I don't know what you know what you'd call them, but they were basically teardrop shaped. And they would just go over the lug nuts and they would point in a certain direction. And they were all pointing in the same direction when you would put them on. So if one of the lug nuts would get loose, you would see that see that point move. So it was a it was a clear visual indicator. Like you wouldn't have to go around the truck and touch all the lug nuts or torque them down. You just have to walk around and visually you could see, oh that's loose or a bunch of them have come loose. Um, now I was only a teenager at that time. I wasn't in a position to start a business or anything like that, but that was the first time that I thought to myself, shit, that would be a really good business. And you know what? The next year tractor trailers started having these little plastic teardrop things put on the lug nuts that would identify when they were loose. So somebody else, you know, saw the exact same opportunity that I did and they brought them over or they, had a plastic printing plant, you know, make them or whatever they uh, did. Um, it just starts with observation. It just starts with there's there's a problem, there's an opportunity to solve that problem. That's all entrepreneurship is, getting really good at solving problems. So that's why I'm recommending you get yourself one of these spiral bound notepads, keep it with you and just start jotting down business ideas. When I was in the collection industry, I used to use my uh, calendar, like the first two pages of my calendar didn't have any writing on it. Um, like the calendar book that they gave me at the time to just basically, uh, you know, schedule in meetings or if I had to meet with my mentor or something like that, I would ha have it in the calendar and the dates. And on the first couple of pages, I don't think we had much in the way. <laughs> I'm really dating myself now because this was like 30 years ago, but we didn't have much in the way of like, access to internet cell phones were just basic cell phones they were bricks that just had numbers or in some cases you might be able to text them so i would read the newspaper and i would go through the business section i would look for businesses that were doing well stocks that would go that were going up really quickly and i would you know look at the company and what they did and i would try to learn about them and i would write down business ideas in that uh first few couple couple of pages i would also write down business ideas that i'd cook up as i was going about my day-to-day -day stuff in the office I worked in the collection industry and one of the ideas that I wrote down was settling people's debt for a fee. And I, and I had that on the inside leaf of my book. And I went back to that book after they gave me the package, looking at my business ideas. And I said, I think this one's for me. Okay. Yeah, no, great advice. Um, on a side note, yeah, it's pretty hard dating women here in Toronto. Uh, I also <laughs> read your book and you know, uh, I did what you said. I, I just basically turned my gym into uh, my library. Yeah. The book there, uh, Audible. And yeah, uh, yeah don't just stay focused. Yeah, man. Um, grab the School of Entrepreneurship when it opens for enrollment next Monday. There, there's there's lots of gold in there. And if you're in the crypto space, by the way, if you're on the email list, if you pay with uh, crypto, there's a $500 discount. So, um, you know, if you're if you're serious about transitioning, it's it's got it's got gold, dude. It's like six hours of lectures in there. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so All much. Right. All right. Thanks, brother. Take care. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up on that note. It's been about 90 minutes and uh, Rich is done. Um, I'll be back next Monday, provided I don't get my clock clean in my fight on, on Saturday. But, uh, uh, you know, we'll talk about more intimate details of entrepreneurship and what's in the course because, of course, launches for enrollment. So we'll take call ins and we'll dive down all those rabbit holes. We'll do all that stuff then. So I want to thank you guys for watching. Appreciate you all immensely. Um, Say, uh, say just for the uh, podcast outro and, uh, you know, take a look at my website and my links and my supplement line and all that good stuff. And we'll see you guys real soon. Have an awesome week. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that podcast, make sure you visit my website at richcooper.ca to learn more about my courses, my book, The Unplugged Alpha, community, 
or booking me for private coaching. Also, if you are a Canadian with $15,000 or more of credit card debt and what you are doing right now isn't paying off the balances, then visit totaldebtfreedom.ca and hit get a free quote to see if you qualify to settle your credit card debt for less than you owe today over the next 48 months. Make sure you check out the top pinned comment on YouTube for all the links mentioned during the show. Peace.